All right. Hello, everyone. This is Maurice Jones. I'm the owner of Industry Spheres, Industry Spheres Business Networking Organization and Events. And I have today the pleasure of having Mr. Eric Carter on the interview with me. Eric Carter is an entrepreneur and business owner in the can cannabis industry. Eric, please introduce yourself. Hey, man, look, uh, Maurice, man, I'm, I'm glad to be here, be able to share this stage with you, this forum in front of your audience. I'm excited. Um, for those of you guys that need to know I am, my name is Eric Carter. I'm, a, I'm just like you, except I'm a paid him advocate, basically. And I, I live in Dallas, Texas. And yeah, I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur in this space. And I've been exploiting and taking advantage of opportunities since the original Farm Bill and certainly through the 2018 Farm Bill and and just trying to share that with as many people as possible and help as many people as possible along the way. Perfect, perfect. Well, we're talking about the event that is coming up on Thursday, July 25th at yes, 4 p.m. Uh, it is the Cannabis Industry Happy Hour Business Networking Mixer. It is at the venue events on the marquee in Frisco. Uh, that address is 6560 John Hickman Parkway, Suite 100 in Frisco, Texas, being from 4 p.m. start time all the way through 7 p.m. And uh, at 8 p.m., there'll be a live band and a good time, a good little after party. But Eric, Mr. Carter, we have you as our subject matter expert and uh, presenter, and you being able to educate about uh, some of the secrets to get into and start a business in the cannabis industry. So I just have a series of questions that I have for you. And uh, do you mind if I call you Uncle Easy as, as you're notoriously known as nowadays? Man, please do, man. I, I used to be Big Easy, but once the muscle started to go away and the gray hair started to come in, everybody starts calling me Uncle Easy, man, colloquially, so that's fine. You can do it too. All right, all right. Well, starting with our questions, we'll make this short and sweet. How has the recent research advanced our understanding of cannabis as a medicine? So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned those two words, like recent along with research, because there really isn't any recent research. So back in the 1940s, they first discovered CBD. In 1971, the National Institute of Health had, de had made some determinations. They found out, and this is NIH, they found out that people that were struggling with cancer, stage four cancer, 20% of the time without chemotherapy and without radiation, they were able to take a Rick Simpson oil product and go from stage four to stage nothing. They figured that out in 1971. They figured out that it helped with Alzheimer's. They figured out that it helped with epilepsy. They figured out that it helped with so many different conditions. And then 1974 came along and they're like, hey, we need to stamp this real quick and put it on this list of schedule one drugs so there could be no more research on it. So when you start asking about recent research, until they deschedule it from schedule one to schedule three, schedule one being right up there with heroin and cocaine, until they deschedule it or reschedule it, there can't really be any research research. Everything that's come about in recent years has been of, of anecdotal research. People like Rick Simpson who used it and uh, destroyed all of his basal cell carcinoma in the skin people that have used it for asthma, people that use it for diabetes, people that use it for epilepsy, people that use it for neuropathy, people that use it for liver and kidney disease and all these different autoimmune diseases like MS and, and uh, arteriosclerosis and uh, everything you can imagine. That's all anecdotal research, man, because they really don't have a license to study it the way that it really, really should be studied to actually look at it as medicine. But everything that's been coming out down the pike ever since, because now there's the Israeli studies, there's German studies. They're just validating the stuff that's been around since 1971. And hopefully when they reschedule it, there's going to be a lot more forthcoming. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. That was definitely a lot of great information. And it sounds like the Rick, Rick Simpson oil was something that is definitely uh, here to help with any of the medical ailments that people are facing in, in this world today. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great uh, time to people to be educated and empowered and learn how they can get off the traditional pharmaceutical medicines that are prescribed and actually use this plant that has been placed on this earth for all of its uh, medicinal purposes. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Question number two, what are some critical factors to consider when starting a cannabis business? Well, you know, right after the 2018 farm bill, man, there's so much profit in it. 
that everybody wanted to jump in. And I remember I was importing uh, raw oil into the United States, about $19,000 a kilo, and which is about the size of a two liter bottle of Coca-Cola. People started to say, you know what? It's going to be a sub $10,000 day on this stuff. And I couldn't believe it. But people rushed into the marketplace. They started buying equipment. They started buying farms. They started setting up distribution networks. And they were able to sell things like 500 milligrams worth of CBD for $249. I watched it go from 19,000 a kilo to that sub $10,000 mark, like $9,700. And I saw all those original people that jumped into the marketplace begin to lose their shirt because you can't service your debt on such a small margin anymore. So a lot of them went bankrupt. They got bought up by big corporate farms and big corporate industries. And then we watched it go from sub 9,000 to sub 6,000 to sub 5,000. So now I can really legitimately get a kilo worth of it because now it could be grown here as opposed to ex import it. I can get a kilo of it if I try really hard for about seven or $800. So the entire industry has changed. It's made it so that it's more available to everybody. I like that part. I like the fact that instead of 500 milligrams worth of CBD oil or $250 or $299, you can now get 5,000 milligrams worth of CBD oil for about 150, in some cases as low as $75. So it made it more available for everybody else. And along the way, I've watched it um, become more palatable for everybody. It's becoming more mainstream. So the critical factor to consider when you do, do a biz, cannabis business, but certainly in a business, is what is your strength in the marketplace? What is your weakness in the marketplace? What opportunities can you recover in the marketplace and what threat are you facing in the marketplace? So the biggest threat right now is legislation coming out of Washington. We don't know what this is gonna look like over the next 12 months to 60 months. And people that jump in, even though they stand to gain a lot of money, they stand to risk it all too. Got it, got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, what are the biggest challenges cannabis entrepreneurs face, if there are any, and how can they overcome them? Well, it's it's kind of like the Me Too movement, right? Um, there's so much biomass out there that you can buy it for next to nothing. But then how do you take your product, this great idea that you have, and put it in people's houses? At the end of the day, it's all about distribution. That's the issue. You can't market CBD, can't market THC, can't market cannabis products on YouTube, they'll take you down. Can't market on Facebook, they'll take you down. So how do you get your message out there? That's the biggest challenge. And then once you get that out there and you start producing it, if you've got some losses, unlike traditional business, you can't write off your losses against income on your federal tax forms. And until they pass the CARES Act, until they pass the CARES Act, any losses that you incur, you have to absorb yourself. You don't get to write them off. In other words, your government is your silent business partner taking and sharing in all the profit with you, but none of the risk and losses. So tax wise, there's a huge issue and hopefully the CARES Act uh, gets passed and make it simpler for people to spread their losses out over four or five years the same way Amazon's been able to and Microsoft and for motor companies, every company out there can do it, except for cannabis companies. So hopefully um, those challenges get to be overcome and get mitigated so that cannabis entrepreneurs can really benefit from the same tax structures, the same tax advantages that every other traditional business has. I think you great, great answer there. All right, how can a new business owner navigate the complexities of cannabis licensing and compliance? And I know that you mentioned uh, you know, the the retail aspect. And, you know, when I was first exploring various endeavors and, and pursuing getting into the business, I was more interested in the growing and cultivation uh, operation, that whole process. But uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Man, it is tough because all laws are local. And what I mean by that is the laws that you talk about for yourself may be different than the laws I talk about from myself or somebody in Oklahoma, or somebody in New York City. You see every, every township, every municipality, like every ward, every uh, parish, depending on where you are, every city, state, county, 
they all have their own laws in which you're, you're governed by. So then once you decide on a location, you now have to go up the chain of every regulatory authority between where you start to open up your business and where your products are being delivered and make sure you're compliant all the way around. And that's the difficulty. Um, that's one. There's so much money required on the legal aspect to make sure that even though you're legal in your township, that your county can't come through and shut you down, that your state won't come through and shut you down, that the federal government won't come through and shut you down. There's not just one standard like it would be if you sold bubblegum to be legal. And then in many of those cases, even though your parish, your township, your ward says, hey, we can do all of this stuff. Your city, your state, your county says, yeah, you can do all this stuff. Maybe some of it says you still have to make sure you're not within 500 yards of a school. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that has to be considered. This is not just like starting your typical mom and pop shop. It's difficult and it's challenging all the way around. Yes. Thank you. And, and I, I want to add another question um, it, it, there. A lot of people don't really know how much it may actually cost in order to start and own a business in the cannabis industry. And I know from a growing and cultivation process, uh, from that standpoint, it may be, uh, you know, over one hundred thousand dollars and maybe from a, a retail dispensary, uh, you know, it may be, you know, upwards of fifty thousand dollars or more. Or maybe from if you were doing white labeling and doing the jars and packaging, I know that there's many ways and avenues to get into it. But uh, can you just kind of give someone an, an inkling of, of how much it may uh, cost them as far as an investment to get into the business? Well, Mr. Jones, I'm going to tell you, and I'll be honest with you, if you're going to go into the cannabis space from any level, um, go in it with the understanding that you're probably going to go bankrupt the first time. Whether you manage to get in it for 50000 or you spend a quarter of a million, half a million dollars to get in it like I did the first time around, just plan to go bankrupt. And if you do that, you'll be on, you'll at least have the right mindset. You see, according to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, one out of every two businesses are going to fail within the first year. Out, and that's all businesses. In the second year, out of those 50% of the left, 50% of those will go bankrupt in the next second to five years. They're going to go bankrupt. It's even higher in the cannabis space because there's so much going on. If you're gonna open up a business in the cannabis space, everybody's trying to get their pound of flesh from you. The people that you're trying to rent a location from are typically gonna look at you at high risk. So they're gonna ask for larger deposits. Whoever you do your banking with, they're gonna consider you high risk and your credit card processing fees are going to be higher. You're going to try to build a market out of nothing. And here's the interesting thing about it from a retail perspective. And I saw it firsthand. Let's say, Mr. Jones, that you start out with a great location and you're producing $50,000 a month in your location. It's awesome. People are coming in everywhere to do business with you. Somebody else now who looks at your business model, looks at your location and says, man, Mr. Maurice Jones has a great thing going on right here. Let me build one across the street from him. Now you've already built the market up. The people are coming to your location, but the guy that decides to open up one right next door to you across the street from you now gets to enjoy half the market share that you built up. And if you're unable to survive at 50% of that and you go out of business, when you go out of business, the guy across the street now gets 100% of the market that you built. The customer loyalty is not necessarily there like you find other things. You have to stay ahead of current trends, and it typically costs you a lot of money to do that. So you have access to things like tinctures. Everybody does. But what makes you different? Do you have access to uh, THC-infused fried chicken batter? Do you have the ability to do uh, jello shots? Do you have the ability to do all sorts of things? And if you don't, may as well make as much money as you can because if it's successful, Somebody's going to copy your model and they're going to be close enough to you in proximity to take away half your business. All right. Well, that was, that was great. I uh, appreciate that. 
Sure. So you talked about uh, a little bit of legislation and, um, you know, as well as, you know, how to get the product to to the consumers. Right. Um, what are the key regulatory challenges for for cannabis business, you know, operating in multiple states? Hmm. Well, that's a whole nother. That, that's a whole nother set of problems. So some states won't let you export out their state if you grow in their state. Some states won't let you import into their state, so you have to be into their state. You have to be in their state. And that includes your raw goods and your finished products, just depending on what the law is. If you're going to ship from state to state, you have to be 2018 Farm Bill compliant and be compliant on the federal level. That gives you some leeway. But once you do that, you're good to export from one state to the next because federally that's what that covers under the interstate commerce clause. But once you have a brick and mortar location, well, now you have to be compliant again with all those different municipalities. It makes them really, really difficult, it makes it really, really challenging. The good news is that 2018 changed the definition of what marijuana is, it changed the definition of what hemp is, it changed the definition of cannabis, it changed the definition of what's legal and what's illegal. If you want to be federally compliant, you just need to follow the 2018 Farm Bill. And that makes sure you have less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC, that's the active ingredient in all marijuana, in your finished product. The good news is that if it's hemp derived, meaning your products, your crops, your farms, your products have all been certified as industrial hemp, then it's based upon the dry weight. So your potency, 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, or 150 milligrams, is dependent upon the size of the finished product that you're producing and shipping. And even then you have to be careful. Okay. And you brought up another uh, interesting point. I know with this event that we have, again, the Cannabis Industry Happy Hour Business Networking Mixer on Thursday, August 25th at events on the marquee. I know that a lot of our attendees will be able to discuss some of their favorite strains, uh, some of their favorite methods of how to consume uh, THC. And, you know, I know that there'll be some of these um, very popular uh, names out there, these strains, but you had mentioned Delta 9. What about those that are still uh, not really sure or, or know all about, you know, the differences, you know, from the Delta 9 to what they would consider things that they can get from the dispensaries or as well as from the streets? Yeah, it's just it's just definition, right? And people don't know what they don't know. So the active ingredient in all cannabis has always and always will be Delta 9 TAC. Now, when you're talking about TAC from a street perspective, they really mean all of it. They don't know the difference. But if you're going to be having the truth and labeling requirements that all municipalities require you to have, now they want to know what type of THC is it and of how much is it going to be. So there's Delta 9 THC. That's the stuff we all know and love. But there's Delta 8 THC. There's Delta 6. There's Delta 10. There's Delta 11 THC. There's HHC. There's THCA. There's THCP. There's THCV. There's so many different types of THC that if you're required to label your product, you have to differentiate which ones are in it according to the label. That being said, there's products out there that are weaker than Delta 9 TAC, like Delta 8 and Delta 10, for example. A lot of people like to call that weed light or TAC light, but there's stuff that's stronger, stuff like uh, THCO, which is more than three times stronger than Delta 9 TAC, that they've rescheduled that because it has some strong psychoactive components to it, stronger than typical Delta 9 TAC. It'll make you see things that aren't there, make you want to do things you don't normally want to do. And there's TACP, for example, which is 300% uh, stronger than Delta 9 TAC, that I can sell legally, by the way, in all 50 states. So when you're having that conversation, understand that TAC is like alcohol. And you got the guy that says, you know what, the strongest alcohol out there is tequila, and I'm going to be a tequila guy. Or the strongest alcohol out there is whiskey, and I'm going to be a whiskey guy or a rum guy in Jamaica. And they're all alcohol. But then there's the guy that says, you know what, I just want to drink a beer. 
Or the young lady says, I just want to have a glass of wine. Well, that's all alcohol, too. It just depends on the strengths. Such is the case with all the deltas. You get to choose how high you want to be or how potent you want your product to be. Thank you for that. All right. So how is the cannabis industry addressing issues related to social equity and inclusion? Because at times uh, it almost seems as if some people are, aren't are meant to get into uh, certain opportunities. So can you elaborate on that? I mean, yeah, you, you're right. Like, for example, Maryland recently just released anybody that was in prison for marijuana charges, released them and gave them a pardon. Places like Chicago allow people who have been arrested for cannabis to be first in line when it comes to getting a license to open up a cannabis dispensary. But then you have places like DC, which we all know is Chocolate City. We've all called it Chocolate City for years. And I recently just got back from DC and meeting with some other cannabis investors and business people there. And I was shocked to find out that not one license um, in the DC area has been issued to any African-Americans. And I was shocked to find that. And if you consider the barriers to entry, those things that we talk about from a tax perspective, from a cash flow perspective, from a lending perspective, it just makes sense. If you don't have the resources in your own network of friends and family or from your own personal resources to be able to invest yourself, you can't get an SBA loan to open up a cannabis business. So it makes it even charging. From a social equity standpoint, I think personally, those people that's been disproportionately affected by the prohibition against cannabis, should certainly be afforded some additional opportunities. But that's just me. And unless you guys vote me for president, that's how it's going to be. I won't be able to change it, right? But we know that it's out there. People that have historically been marginalized um, in cannabis are going to be marginalized moving forward into cannabis, unfortunately. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, again, Thursday, August 25th, Cannabis Industry Happy Hour Business Networking Mixer. Come on out. Uh, high level conversations. Get educated. Get empowered. Learn about what we can do in this in these various industries uh, to be able to you know pursue the path of entrepreneurship and, and and business growth. And one more thing, Mr. Eric Carter, Uncle Easy. Yes, what sir. advice would you give to someone looking to invest in or start a business in the cannabis industry if they are, uh, you know, have a little bit of money to be able to pursue these endeavors? Well, I remember reading a book about 15 years ago written by Bill Gates called The Road Ahead. And he said in the future, there's only going to be two types of businesses, those that are online and those that are out of business. And I see that being borne out today. When you see companies like Instacart coming out of nowhere to deliver products right to people's homes. When you see Uber Eats and you start to see those types of businesses just pop up out of nowhere. When you start to see that companies like Best Buy that's been around for years is now getting 35% of their sales coming from online sales. When you see that as the trend, when you see McDonald's trying to figure out how you can take an app, order product, pick it up versus coming inside the store. When you see that the trend is going online. You need to find a way to get online with your cannabis business. I know that uh, I know that some of my friends with with Canaglobe have found a way to do that. I know that uh, for a lot of people who go to the shift.store forward slash mojo m o j o shift dot store forward slash mojo m o j o people that go there are now enjoying the ability to instead of walking into a brick and mortar, they can sit at home and click and order products that they like flour. We got, they got it. Gummies, they got that. Um, mocktails, like adult beverages that are THC infused, so you don't wake up in the morning with hangovers. They've got those types of things. Rick Ross and Snoop Dogg and Cheech and Chong products. Honestly, if you're trying to get into the cannabis space now, try to do it on the cheap. So that if things change drastically, you get a chance and the opportunity to take advantage of market share, but you don't have a lot of exposure on the risk side because of heavy capital infusions and acquisitions and uh, costs up front. Great, great. So it sounds like it's, it's smarter to, to get a business being online because as you may know, uh, the online retail shopping has totally disrupted the retail industry. And that's, that's, that's the way to go. 
It is. Awesome. Just and is. Uh, Uncle Easy, you have a product that is available for purchase. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do. I got into the, I got into the cannabis space because I'm a, I'm a former Marine Scout sniper. I was dealing with PTSD heavily, and I was dealing with self-medicating myself with alcohol. And not to get all into it, but I replaced my alcohol consumption with cannabis. And I was able to reduce my daily drinking down to one or two uh, joints a month and de-stress myself where I wanted to get rid of violence. And so I went out, made it my mission to start sharing that with other veterans. Because as you know, 22, roughly 23 of us commit suicide every day because they're unable to cope and, and be reacclimated into the major society. That I wanted to introduce a product that's that helps with the cancer, that helps with the diabetes, that help with the with the multiple sclerosis, that help with the uh, the kidney functions and the liver functions and all this other kind of stuff. And it's called Rick Simpson oil. I didn't invent it. A guy named Rick Simpson reprocessed it and put his name on it, made it available for everybody. All I did was package it. And I've got the strongest form of Rick Simpson oil anywhere in the country that can be shipped to all 50 states, the strongest. 17,400 milligrams and one syringe worth of it. And I'm watching people who have lumps in their chest go away. I'm watching people who have struggles, struggle to sleep, find the ability to sleep. I found a young man who had a, 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 an enlarged prostate, uh, finding himself able to sleep through the night. The product works phenomenally well and it's priced better than competitively because we're not really trying to profit off of it. The idea is to just help as many people as we can. The product, for those of you guys that know people with those chronic illnesses, they've got uh, autoimmune diseases. A lot of them are finding a lot of relief with this product and I'm happy to have introduced it and uh, make it available to people. Congratulations. I definitely uh, know that the whole world needs to take great advantage of that and uh, being able to reverse those various ailments that you mentioned. And you had that opportunity to, to also have your own brand. We know that you had mentioned earlier various tequilas, whiskeys, and rums. And then there's, you know, certain brands that a lot of people are loyal to as well. So you got your own brand out there and uh, how is that possible? And can anyone have that, uh, po you know, that ability to have their own brand and, and getting it out on the online retail market like you did? Absolutely. It costs a lot to do it one way, but the way we do it and people who show up tomorrow show up for this Thursday mixer. I got to get more details so they can have a they're gonna have an advantage over those people that don't show up but we found a way to help the average ordinary person who just has a vision um, and have limited resources to get their own brand be able to have a opportunity to have a distribution network built in from day one we found a way to do that and that's what we're doing to change in the game so hopefully uh the people who are listening to this come on to uh come out to your event I'll be there speaking. I'll be shaking hands and kissing babies, so to speak, and letting people see the products and sample products. Probably it's going to be a great time. Um, but yes, we have people that are introducing all kinds of products and not all of them have to be cannabis. The, there's a huge future market in mushrooms as well. The non psychedelics, but the neurotropes and adoptogenics, things that are good for your overall health. And we'll be talking about that tomorrow as well. All right. Well, you heard it first and you've heard it from Uncle Easy. Uh, he, he's going to be, again, our subject matter speaker expert, subject matter expert speaking on this topic at our event on Thursday, August 25th, Cannabis Industry Happy Hour Business Networking Mixer. And if you want to attend any of our future events, stay tuned for what we have in store for you by way of following our industry spheres platform. So again, Uncle Easy, thank you for your time. And you said that you're the they can find your your Rick Simpson oil. What's that that website again? Shift.store forward slash mojo. M-O-J-O. Shift.store forward slash mojo. And and Mr. Jones, it has it has certainly been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege to be able to share this form with you and discuss everything going on in the cannabis space. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Uncle Easy. We look forward to having you on 
the 25th of July. And if we need to get you booked for some upcoming events, I'm sure that we can make that uh, possible. So thank you so much. And we look forward to you blessing everyone with your presence and your knowledge on August, I'm sorry, July 25th. Awesome, brother. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. All right. Thank you so much. All right.